Okay, so now pushing over towards some of the broad theories about environmental triggers for aggression. And no surprise, theories are a dime a dozen, all sorts of theorists over the years, and some of which occasionally feel obliged to actually go see if there's data supporting it. But what I'll just touch on briefly are three very broadly different schools of thinking about environmental factors in aggression. The first school is one that says environment is irrelevant. And you can bet how much I'm going to like that here in the coming minutes. And who is the main advocate of that? Our ever-reliable friend, Herr Nazi Konrad Lorenz. Konrad Lorenz, after he had gotten out of his prison camp after World War II for being a Nazi propagandist, and he sort of dusted himself off and got his ethology empire going again, and remarkably was forgiven by the other elder fathers of ethology, including Nico Tirnbergen, who spent much of World War II in a concentration camp, and he's the one who led the move to make sure that Konrad Lorenz was welcomed back in the community, even though he was an unrepentant Nazi swine. But so, after Konrad Lorenz came out, in the early 60s, he wrote a book which was one of the most influential anthropology books of all time, a book called On Aggression. And that was the coffee table book for half a decade. That was the book that people had book clubs about if they were intellectuals. On Aggression had a huge influence on people's thinking at the time. And what was Lorenz's ba basic premise as to what were the environmental components of aggression? What was aggression about? It was exactly the book you would expect to be written by an unrepentant Nazi. Because his theme was just following biological orders. In Lorenz's view, on his view as to what aggression is about, it is inevitable. There is no environmental requirement. Aggression is universal and inevitable. Famous quote of his that he gave, for example, near his death in the 1970s to Newsweek, there is no love without hate. Wow, he must have been a great father. But what you see <laughs> is a whole book, a whole premise built on that. A number of the notions, the basic themes that ran through the book. Number one, aggression is universal. It is there in all individuals. Number two, what he called his hydraulic model of aggression. And if this sounds silly, you should actually go see the book because he had actual diagrams of like pseudo toilet bowl plumbing stuff telling us how aggression works as follows. There is some aggression toilet bowl water tank which is slowly filling up with water. And the deal is that the higher the levels of water get, the higher the aggressive drive, the less of an environmental trigger it takes to provoke the aggression to come out. The higher the levels, the more easily a releasing stimulus will trigger fixed action patterns of aggression. Intrinsic in his model also, and explicitly stated, was eventually his toilet bowl fills up with enough, actually it's not the toilet bowl, it's the tank. The tank fills up with enough water that it begins to dribble over the top and thus you get spontaneous aggression. His model was with the passage of time, the longer it has been since an organism has been aggressive, the less of an environmental releaser is needed to provoke the aggression until it is ultimately spontaneous. The third piece of his model was just like a toilet bowl, again, which is when you have an aggressive act, you have just emptied out the tank, you deplete the aggressive drive, you deplete it so that it resets the system starting a refractory period. That aggression decreases the likelihood of aggression occurring immediately afterward. This was the Lorenzian model, which was enormously, enormously influential, and everybody learned about this in intro anthro through the 1960s, and it would take you about two seconds to shred this one. Okay, how many of you have ever murdered anyone? Okay, you never know, people are kind of drowsy, checking their emails and suddenly confess. Okay, how many of you plan to murder somebody? Yes, we are like the most dangerously aggressive species on this planet, and the vast majority of us will never have a physical fight with somebody since we left seventh grade or so. Aggression is not universal. Aggression is not inevitable. And aggression is not sublimated into psychological processes, which thus can pass as support for this model. 
The final thing that does it in is aggression is not self-depleting. Aggression is self-reinforcing. And all you have to do is look at the crowd contagion, the emotional contagion that occurs in soccer stadiums when people start fighting, crowd violence, all of that. Aggression is not self-depleting and resetting the clock. Aggression stimulates more aggression. Aggression legitimizes it. It habituates you to it. It is not fitting Lorenz's model at all. Meanwhile, on the other end of the block was a very, very different sort of view, and this is one that permeates a lot of thinking in the field, and this is one built around the notion that aggression is ultimately all about frustration. It is about frustration, pain, stress, fear, anxiety, and this was a view very heavily pushed by Soviet researchers in the period of the Soviet Union, a very Marxist view, because essentially what you conclude at the end is this theme I keep bringing up every time pointing out that the amygdala has something to do with both aggression and fear, that in a world in which no amygdaloid neuron need have an action potential out of fear, there's not going to be aggression. So this is the extreme version of the frustration displacement model. And what is emphasized in that is a lot of data. You look at, for example, when levels of unemployment go up. Levels of spousal abuse go up. Levels of child abuse go up. When the economy gets bad, the same exact thing. Laboratory animals, shock a rat, it will bite the one sitting next to it. All of these versions of displacement aggression. In a baboon troop, for example, almost 50% of aggression is displacement aggression after somebody loses a fight or loses access to a resource. <laughs> almost certainly, this begins to explain two really, really depressing things about unequal societies. First one being that the poorer you are, the more likely you are to be violent, the more likely you are to commit some sort of criminal violence. And when the economy gets bad, the rates of that get worse, it gets more skewed. And the other ironic piece of all of that is that when crimes, when, uh, when crime goes up in lower socioeconomic strata, overwhelmingly it is crime turned on the other poor. When crime goes up during periods of frustration and mistreatment of lower socioeconomic classes, it does not take the form of suddenly everybody going and deciding to like scale the wall to the palace there and you know rip off some of the Ming vases. It is victimizing the people who are victims right next door to you. During times of economic downturns, the rates of crime in poorer neighborhoods go up and it's almost always turned on individuals in that neighborhood. So that supports this picture as well. One interesting thing that argues against frustration displacement models, and this is looking at animals and looking at what happens to levels of aggression during periods of famine. And this has been studied in a surprising number of species. And what you've got are two very opposing predictions. First one is, if what aggression is about is built out of frustration, need, pain, fear, hunger, things of that sort, the prediction would be when you look at populations of animals during periods of famine, aggression should go up over food resources. And this comes with the qualifier that these studies have to be during a period when animals are having to work harder to get the normal amounts of food rather than that they are being calorically deprived because obviously behavior is going to be changed then. So frustration displacement model predicts that during periods of famine, aggression goes up in social species. A very different model would predict exactly the opposite. And what the bulk of the literature has shown is during periods of famine in wild animals and social groups, aggression tends to go down rather than up. So at least in that realm, that tends to be a vote against one particular type of frustration displacement <laughs> aggression. It tends to go down. And in fact, a term has been given for that by people who think about these things. It's referred to as behavioral fat. Why does aggression go up, for example, among young male lions, not during the periods of the year when there's not much food, but during the peak of, say, zebra migration? What's going on there? You got a lion, it's sitting there saying, I'm not hungry, my stomach's full, there's nobody to hunt, nobody's going to mate with me right now, so I might as well go get in a fight with somebody. 
And in that scenario, what aggression is about is use of surplus resources when there is an excess. It is behavioral fat. And in lots of species, you see aggression as a model of behavioral fat rather than purely resource deprivation. One interesting interpretation that I've seen of one type of violence, which is the notion that violence, aggression, competition being built around limited resources, a very interesting interpretation of clan violence, of feuds, of vendettas, of retributive violence, which has been a large percentage of violence over the centuries. A way to formalize that is to think that these are two different clans at war with each other, competing for a very, very singular resource, the one who does the last bit of retribution. That's what they're competing for. So an interesting interpretation there. Third broad branch of people thinking about theorizing about aggression, and these are, of course, our behaviorists. Back to Watson and Skinner and give me a child of any background and let me control rewards and positive reinforcements and punishments and negative reinforcements, all of that, and I will be able to regulate any aspect of behavior. We know that whole approach by now. We saw all the ways in which that fails in explaining classical ethologically based behavior, but in the standard behaviorist view have enough opportunities for punishment and you can shape, you can condition away, you can eliminate aggressive behavior. And all you need to do is think for two seconds and see that that is very limited in its applicability. Nicely, huge number of experiments have been going on for two centuries in this country looking at that, which is looking at rates of crime as levels of punishment, the length of jail sentences, the likelihood of being ca caught, things like that. As the punishment likelihood and severity changes, does that change the likelihood of crime? Most studied is the very specific question of what does the death penalty decrease the amount of murders? As different states have eliminated the death penalty, as they've reinstated it, things of that sort, does changing your behaviorist realm of punishment that you could get for killing someone, does that decrease the incidence of murders? And what you wind up seeing is, in some cases, yes, absolutely. When you are looking at murders that involve premeditated violence, when it is someone who is sitting there for months planning how to do this, when somebody who is hired to kill somebody, things of that sort, when it is planned in advance, increased likelihood of death penalty does indeed decrease the likelihood of premeditated murder. However, it does not touch for a second impulsive murder, crimes of passion, things of that sort, and that makes perfect sense. There is no person who has just been insulted in a bar and pulls out a gun who stops for a second and thinks, wait a second, did the state legislature pass that new law last week? Let me think about it. They don't think about that because they don't think. And the majority of violence in that realm is unpremeditated. Mostly what the studies have shown is changing the severity of punishment for murder does not particularly change the murder rates. So these broad different sorts of views, aggression as inevitable, biologically inevitable, all environment can do is shape the frequency a bit. Aggression as solely a product of fear, frustration, anxiety, resource deprivation. Aggression solely as a set of behaviors that could be shaped by reward and punishment to the point of going away. 